So today we're talking about Gideon's son, who actually ends up killing his entire family and creates a huge mutiny. And then we're going to wrap up with the grandson of a dodo and a judge with 30 donking riding sons. So wow. this should be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what's next on HC Daily. You're listening to another episode of HC Daily, a daily devotional podcast that you can listen to at home or on the go. We believe that you can grow as much as you want to grow spiritually, and this podcast can be a part of your daily growth plan. So, whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify, or your favorite podcast app, we're glad you're here. Now, let's join our hosts, Jeff Forrester and Chris Zarbaugh in the studio. So, Jeff, yes. now that the NFL draft is behind us, yes. I just want to ask you, for all of our fans who believe in you and mm-hmm. they believe in De- the Detroit Lions, mm, yes, uh, and those are the same. I was going to say, those I are don't... The, those are the same. <laughs> I'd like, I like to distance myself <laughs> from that statement. So but... my question is, were you happy with the choices that Detroit made? Yeah, I was, I was thrilled that Hutchinson dropped to number two. I really thought he would mm-hmm. go number one. Um, I think he's uh, great for this team specifically. So that'll be interesting. Um, trading up was pretty bold, I it thought. It was bold. And, uh, but essentially what you got was um, we traded our uh, two picks, moved up 20 spots for a number 34 pick is basically what we got to do. We moved up two picks at 20, 20 spots. Yeah. That was pretty great. So that was bold. We'll just see. You know, you, you just never know. Uh, we don't have a very good record of... Uh, drafting receivers named Williams, <laughs> so right, right. so we'll see what happens on that. But yeah. man, he he's got speed and and he's good. So it'll be fun. I don't know if it'll change the game for us as far as wins and losses, but it'll be fun to watch. Well, when we traded up, my son thought based on what we gave away, he's like, I think we're going to tr- get a quarterback. Oh, yeah. I'm like, well, we have a quarterback, and he's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's the guy that actually bought the shirt that says uh, Detroit Rams. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. from uh-huh. last year. Right, you know, right. just so excited. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so uh, it's fun. It's exciting stuff. I'm I'm hoping it works out. Same old lines. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> you never yeah. know. Yeah, I, it feels to me like you relish in it. I mean, but you're a you're a Cleveland fan. You should have compassion on on Detroit fans. Well, to to all my favorite listener out there, uh-huh. I would just say that uh, I grew up near Cleveland as a Cleveland Browns fan. I ended up living in Detroit. The literally. The two worst teams in the NFL. Right, right. So I am just, I am like, I am like uh, the children of Israel in slavery, mm-hmm. calling out, saying like, "Why deliver us?" Right, right. I've just got stuck like, rooting for the two worst teams in the NFL. Right. Well, now we have all these people mad at us. Mm-hmm. Right. You're probably going to get an angry email this week saying, you know, why do you trash talk us? Uh, because uh, defining reality is what a leader yeah. does. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That is reality. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We, you know. <clears throat> Get it straight. Hey, all I know is that for the 2022 uh, season, we're, we're, we're undefeated right now. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. Go Lions. Mm-hmm. Go Lions. So today we're talking about Abimelech, who is uh, Gideon's son. Yeah, yeah. So it covers a lot of ground. So we're really going to summarize his life. We're not going to read the passages there. Yeah. But we'll, it's, it's we'll summarize his life because it's long. So Abimelech is a guy who, as you remember from yesterday's podcast, uh, Gideon was offered to be a king, the ruler, uh, him and his son and his son's son. Mm-hmm. And, and Gideon said, no, I, I don't think that I want to create a dynasty. I don't want to be a ruler. But Abimelech is a guy who actually is an illegitimate son, right? Yeah, so, that, that's the way that the, the Jewish people would have viewed him. I don't know that there are any illegitimate children. There, there are illegitimate parents, <laughs> right, <laughs> right? right? But God always planned for Abimelech, um, as he has planned for every child, but he certainly was branded that way because he was the son of a concubine. Yeah, he wasn't the a, son of a yeah. That's good perspective. Of a wife. Yeah. Well, the the Bible literally says that Gideon has seven seventy sons, and then he also had a concubine in Shechem. Right. Right. So this woman in Shechem gives birth to a boy named Abimelech. Yeah. So he actually had seventy one sons. Seventy one sons. Which, by the right. way, my father had five sons. Right. And I was the fifth son, and he and the only reason why he kept on having kids is he was hoping for a girl. Yeah. Well, he doesn't hold a candle to get to the to a <laughs> seventy Gideon. sons. Yeah, seventy yeah. sons. He's a boy making machine. So you know the 
the Bible often records events, it records behaviors that God does not endorse. As a matter of fact, records a lot of things that God expressly forbid, like Gideon marrying all these wives, Gideon keeping a concubine. Deuteronomy 17, God expressly forbid Mm -hmm. this practice for rulers of Israel. But one of the things I love about the Bible, one of the reasons why I believe the Bible is things like this, because the Bible just tells things the way they were, not the way that God or we wished they were. That's right. So he's very, very uh, eyes wide open, very blunt about the circumstances that are happening. If you and I were trying to invent a religion Mm -hmm. and we were trying to set a moral code, which there's a very strong moral code in the Jewish faith, but if we were trying to fake it, we would not include the train wreck lives of the leaders and the influencers and the heroes that are mentioned in the Bible. Yeah, and and, and you have to wonder about that. Like, uh, it, it's a beautiful thing in some ways, because a lot of times the people of the past, they make these great mistakes, and God uh, sometimes even uses them and, and, and does things, I think, for them in their yeah. lives, but also does them with a foreshadowing of sort of knowing that the people who... Uh, we'll read about them later, you know, we'll learn lessons from them, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. We're supposed to learn lessons from the past. Yeah. All of that to say, I, I love the fact that the scripture records people with broken lives. And you're right. Like if we were trying to create a really strong case, we would never, ever include these stories. Right, right. But God allows them to be recorded for the future because, again, it's just a testament of the fact that we are an imp- imperfect people uh, trusting in and, and learning lessons about a perfect God who loves us. And and to be very, very clear, when you read these stories, God is not endorsing the bad behavior. Right. And God is not just kind of winking at it going, well, you know, people right. do bad things. So I'm going to bless them anyways. So he's not blessing them in their bad behavior. What What you are seeing is there are moments when they surrender to God, God steps in and blesses. And there's moments when they are self-willed and they do what they want to do. And that's what yesterday's episode talks about when uh, Gideon does not seek God's guidance with regard to worship or with regard to his family. And there are consequences to us when we walk away from God. So the Christian life is not an, you know, if, if it was a chart, it's not an up and to the right chart all the time. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. There are times when we're really sold out and there's times we're really not sold out to God, right? He blesses on those high spots, and then there are consequences in the low spots every day of our life. And I think this is what you find with with Gideon. So one of the low spots was that he kept a a woman in Shechem, has a son named Abimelech. Abimelech grows up, kind of ticked off that his dad didn't keep a dynasty, and Mm -hmm. he decided, I think my dad was wrong on that. And so he wanted to take his father's place and he wanted to be a king. Well, well the, the name Abimelech actually translates into son of a king. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so in other words, Gideon named him probably. Yeah, yeah probably. Right? And so, uh, so Gideon, again, there's that reflection of that, like, <laughs> even though I'm not a king, really, son, do you know who your dad is? Yeah. So how humble was he when he was saying, no, I don't want to be a king? Right. He named his 71st son king, son right. of a king, right. <laughs> right? I don't know if it's his 71st son, but I mean, it was one of his 71 sons. He named him son of a king. So he had this secret pride maybe that didn't demonstrate itself in, so, out so, in public. So Abimelech gets to the place where he decides he wants to be the ruler. He approaches the people and says, make me your ruler. Mm-hmm. And they agree because he was ruthless. He was, yeah. a, he was a leader who wasn't afraid to do whatever it took. And the Bible actually says that he murdered 69 of his 70 brothers. Yeah keeping only one of them alive. Yeah. Well, I think, it, as we've seen throughout history, people that are tempted by power often acquire it, mm-hmm. and they maintain power through ruthless ways, right? And so as leaders, people of influence, whether we're talking about you know leaders in our friend group or leaders at work or maybe you're a, a, a boss or whatever, we have to constantly be examining our ambitions to see if they're self-centered or God-centered, because power is incredibly dangerous. And there's no shortage of people who want power. There's just a shortage of people who can manage it well. Yeah, well, Abimelech was the opposite of what God wanted in a judge of Israel. Yeah. And it wasn't really a a, a complete nation. It was more like a confederation of states at the time. Yeah, it would have been a lot like um, um, right at our revolution, just before the the revolution uh, that formed the United States, we were like an agreement of these different states Mm. that had a confederation where we're going to help each other out, but stay out of our business, we're going to stay out of yours, because the 12 tribes of Israel were set up that way. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so he goes on and he decides to rule. And, uh, and he becomes then, the ruler of Shechem and Beth Milo, these right. two towns. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and what ends up happening is, is the people eventually regretted setting them up as their king. Oh. So they decided to start a mutiny to overthrow him because they realized they'd made a horrible mistake. Well, he, he winds up getting them to give him a bunch of gold and he takes the money out and he goes and buys a bunch of mercenaries is what he does. And so now he's kind of ruling with this ruthlessness and he's got a bunch of mercenaries that aren't from around there. And these guys have nothing to lose and everything to gain. And it, it, for a while, what they thought is that they were buying peace. Hey, we'll concede some of our freedoms for a little bit of peace. Mm. And eventually they had neither freedom nor peace, which is a whole other issue. But um, he just starts brutalizing these people. And so they decide, fine, we're done with you. And a prophet, Jotham, stands up and goes, let me tell you. And he gives this description of, um, you know, valuable plants and valuable trees that choose not to take over. And then this thorn bush does grow up, this youth, useless uh, uh, bush it winds, winds to be the ruler and it winds up choking out everything else and eventually, you know, loses. And so he's describing the fact that Abimelech was useless and that God was going to remove him. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen for a long time. It was three years three later years, yep. before he was finally removed. That's incredible. Yeah. And so, and, and again, it's it goes back to yesterday's lesson, which is you're free to make your choices. You're just not free to choose the consequences. So the people yeah. made the really poor choice yeah. of letting him be the ruler. Mm-hmm. And so for three years, they had to live with those consequences. Right. And God had said, don't have a king. Right. I'll be your king. Right. But they wanted a king, and mm-hmm. that's what they got. So uh, so everybody tries to overrule Abimelech. He has these mercenaries. Nobody can overthrow him. There's bloodshed. There's ruthlessness. But Abimelech does eventually meet his demise. Oh, yeah. At the hands of a woman. Right. Who uh, a millstone, had a millstone, and she drops it from a high place, assumingly, mm-hmm. onto his head. Yeah. So, so what happens there is um, this mutiny begins, and so he just turns on his people. And he begins to just wipe them out. Eventually, he obliterates the entire city of Shechem, just destroys it, burns the city down, kills all the people. And then the people, there was what's called the Tower of Shechem. It'd be like a fortress. And he goes to war against them because that's like the last stronghold. That's, you know, Helm's Deep kind of place. They're, right. they're hiding out there, protecting themselves from these mercenaries. And um, uh, so he sets it afire. He kills, he burns like a thousand people alive there. But then they're fighting him from the walls. And a woman grabs a, a millstone. It was common in those events inside of city walls where the women would grab things, be up on the walls, where the men would be fighting with bows and arrows and spears and swords. The women would gather around the walls and everything heavy, they just throw it on the bad guys as they mm-hmm. come up close to the wall. That was a part of their fighting strategies. So this woman throws a millstone. It was probably one of the things where they would grind to get a finer level of, of flour so it's probably you know like seven to ten pounds. It's so heavier than a milk jug, but mm. solid rock. She drops it, hits him on the head. He gets a fatal blow, but he doesn't die yet. Mm. So he's laying on the ground. He's knowing he's gonna die. He's ashamed that he's being killed by a woman, and so he asks his armor bearer to stab him with a sword and kill him, so that he didn't have to have the shame of dying by a woman. But God just made sure that that part of the story was included. That that's right. Not not only was he killed by a woman, he died a coward. Right. <laughs> right. And, and the women today are, you know, we, we, we see women in our armed forces and yeah. they're complete warriors that are, yeah. you know, legitimate uh, and, and equal with everybody else. But back in this day, we have to understand the culture is women did not fight. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and unfortunately, they didn't have a very good place in society in terms of their voice and, and respect and everything else. So, uh, so for a woman to throw a rock, you know, if you're a warrior, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, your whole thing is... You want to be the warrior that conquers the best of the men warriors. Yeah. But if you die, die valiantly. Right. Right. One or the other. Right. And then, so just to get hit with this random woman throwing a millstone, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's, he can't handle it. Well, I love through the book of Judges, you know, when you see uh, Deborah. Yes. You see jail, jail with the nail. And you see this woman here. Uh, I love that God makes them the heroes of the story and that you don't find these women, even though they lived in oppressive societies. You don't find them complaining about being victims. You find them rising up, overcoming their victimhood, and participating in effective, powerful ways in 
uh, in their culture and in their circumstances, God uses them as the heroes of the stories. It's fantastic. Yeah. I, I, I love that. I, I, it's one of the themes, I think, through this whole book that people want to blame other people or people want to blame God. They take this victim position. And I love the fact that God says, hey, let me show you some people who didn't take a victim position and let me elevate them. Hmm. And uh, I just think there's so many lessons for us in our society today. Oh, for sure. So anyways, Abimelech dies and he's out of the story now. Uh, Thank goodness he's out of the story. He's a bad guy Hmm. and uh, he's gone. And then, um, you know, I think there's a couple lessons. Uh, I think people who desire power always outnumber those who... Uh, are able to use it wisely. So by the end of Abimelech's life, he no lo- longer had power. Power had him. Yeah. And I think that's true with any of our temptations, whether it's money, it's uh, uh, sex, it's it, power, it's whatever. It, it starts off that we want more of it, and eventually our favorite sin takes us over if we're not careful. Mm. And that that's what you see is this this monster of a human. I don't think he started off wanting to be a monster, but it's what he became. And God had to wipe him out. So we can learn that, you know, our goals control our actions and the corrupting uh, effects of power require humility and require God's wisdom in order for us to manage it wisely. Yeah. And I hate to say this too, but another observation could be the fact that Abimelech was in some ways probably set up for failure. Yeah. The fact that the fact that Gideon named him son of a king when he is, you know, this seen as in culture an illegitimate child right. who's the, who's a concubine. And and so, number one, he feels like he doesn't have an, uh, as much street cred as his other brothers, right? right? He feels like the red-headed stepchild in, in today's culture. Which literally, maybe he was, right? Yeah, maybe he and, was. And, yeah. and he didn't have the same kind of access to his dad. Right. He's trying for approval. Yeah. Right. And then, and then, and then again, he's called son of a king when Gideon refused to be king, mm-hmm. even though he was living like one, even though he had riches and wealth and and everything else. But Gideon was still, in, in spite of his very big faults uh, at later on in life, was still a good ruler because it yeah. said he had kept peace for almost 50 years. Right. Right? right. And so and so here's Abimelech. Again, just a lesson to dads, maybe, right? Yeah. A lesson to parents, um, you know, just to think about uh, the consequences of everything, how your sons and daughters receive, you know, everything that comes from you mm-hmm. or, or the lack of it. Right. Right. So in some ways, you know, you you have to have a little bit of sympathy on Abimelech. Yes. So with Gideon, you know, we we kind of, he's a hero in the first two episodes, and by the last episode, you're going, oh, Gideon, you're making these bad choices at the end. Um, but, you know, we're not measured by, uh, uh, you know, what we perform for God. We're really measured by uh, who God is in us. And God chose to use him in extraordinary ways. But there are consequences to the bad decisions. Abimelech winds up then trying to live up to the bad decisions and the worst decisions of his father's life, and it costs the nation so much. Hmm. So then once he's off the off the, the scene, now we've got these two guys. Tola, yes. he's the grandson of a guy named Dodo, and yep. his dad's name's Pua. Right. So Pua and Dodo are his family. This guy, um, I feel bad for him. You can just can you imagine being in kindergarten in oh, third yeah. grade and all the boys knowing who your dad's name was, your right. grandfather's name. And then um, Jer, and he winds up becoming the father of 30 donkey riding sons. Yeah. So and, let me uh, just read from Judges chapter 10, uh, just verses one through five, which sort of makes the transition between Abimelech and these other two yeah. judges. Uh, so Judges 10 verses one through five, NLT version says, after Abimelech died, Tola, son of Pua, son of Dodo, was the next person to rescue Israel. He was from the tribe of Issachar, but lived in the town of Shemir and the hill country of, Eph- of Ephraim. He judged Israel for 23 years. When he died, he was buried in Shemir. So that's pretty much all we hear mm-hmm. about right. him. And then it says, after Tola died, Jer from Gilead judged Israel for 22 years. His 30 sons rode around on 30 donkeys and they owned 30 towns and the land of Gilead, which are still called the towns of Jer. When Jer died, he was buried in Cayman. And that's it. That's it. So those five verses summarize the two lives of Tola and Jer, and together almost 50 years. Yeah, 45 of, years. Yeah, yeah. 45 mm-hmm. years of peace and ruling and judging Israel, but apparently nothing noteworthy. Nothing, uh, it feels mm. that way. 
There, there, there's a few things I think you see. One, they were clearly wealthy. <laughs> right. They, they, anybody who has 30 sons, you have to be rich. And 30 donkeys, right? So And, and owning 30 towns. Yeah, they ruled over says, 30 towns. Yeah. Which is pretty significant. So so you have that, at least with the second guy, Jer. Um, so here, here's what I see. I think you see quiet influence and good, effective, godly leadership hmm. because they had 45 years of peace. Right. Which, by the way, the people needed so badly after they came out of Abimelech's mess. Mm-hmm. So God gives them this this rest. And even though there aren't any heroic stories told about Tola or Jer's service, um, they they engineered four and a half decades of peace. So here's the final thought. We may never lead heroic battles. Most of us won't, I don't think. Um, and we're not going to deliver our people from the oppressors. Um but I think we're called to live and lead wisely, our families, maybe our team at work, uh, whatever, according to God's words and God's principles, and to bring peace wherever God places us. Mm. And that might be the goal for us, is just to be people of peace wherever we go, to lead and live humble, quiet lives that work for peace. I love that. And that's even in the New Testament, right? To go into a town and find the person of peace. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's just a great thought and great reference because yeah. even though not much is said about Tola and about Jer, uh, it, it's really what isn't said that yeah. is also important as right. well. Right. Because there, there, there are no scandalous stories. Mm-mm. There's no stories about 70 wives and concubines and right. sons. Uh, there is just like, hey, these people lived and they kept peace in Israel. They did their job. And like you said, quiet, uh, unassuming faithfulness yeah. is, is what we kind of feel from those verses. Because God would not have mentioned it if it were not significant. And the, their their effective leadership must have been based on following God's words because God gave them peace, mm. right? If they weren't following God's words, he wouldn't have given them peace, right? right? That, that's what we find through the whole book. Mm-hmm. So they're not just being humble and, and, and compromising in order to get peace. They had to have been leading with God's words, mm. God's way, and they were just effective leaders. Yeah. So that's a great challenge. Become yeah. become a person of peace where God has placed you. Yeah. That's excellent. So next uh, next week, we dive into Samson. Samson. This is the superhero yes. in this book right yes. here. I mean, it, he's, he's the Superman he's of this like, story. He's either Thor or the Incredible Hulk. Whoever yeah. you believe is the strongest Avenger. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so we'll see you then. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help us spread the word by liking this episode and sharing it on your social media platforms. Be sure to leave a comment and review, and don't forget to give us five stars. When you do, you help us reach even more people who need a daily devotional like HC Daily. If you'd like to hear more from Chris and Jeff, they're both teaching pastors at Heritage Church located in Southeast Michigan. You can get more of their messages by clicking on the Messages tab at HeritageChurch.com. Be sure to join us again soon for another episode of HC Daily.